Hey guys, it's Leanna. I'm here today to talk about books that I'm hypocritical about. So I'm fairly well known for my rant reviews and unpopular opinions. <laughs> Piss a lot of people off on a regular basis. I am well aware. And um, I do realize, I think, because when I talk about books that I do like, I'll often say like, I know in, in the past I've criticized books for this, but in this book it doesn't bother me because whatever. So I'm gonna go through a list of books that, um, I guess we're gonna go with the one I that hated or accused it of being a flawed in a particular way. Uh, and then I'm gonna tell you about a book that does the exact same thing that I love. <laughs> Basically arming my enemies with uh, ways to call me um, a hypocrite and a liar. <laughs> Okay, so I hate Throne of Glass. I tried so, 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 so hard to like Throne of Glass, to get into Throne of Glass, to read Throne of Glass. I owned like all the Throne of Glass books and then got rid of all the Throne of Glass books. <laughs> and I accuse it of, of, of like the world building being terrible, of the main character being really kind of childish and unlikable and emotional. And I just really don't like the main character for that reason. And uh, I was like, this it's saying that it's a fantasy, but really it's just a romance with like a lot of romance in it. And it's just like a lot of like wordy, flowery descriptions of things amounting to nothing. And I don't think I'm wrong about that. I think Throne of Glass really is all those things, but I love Shatter Me. <laughs> Um, and Sh I didn't, okay, the first Shatter Me book, I low-key hated for most of it. And then by the end of the first Shatter Me book, I was like, I'm kind of into this. Also, how the fuck can Warner be the endgame romance, which all of the merch has informed me he must be, or like, he will be. And I was like, how? I got tricked into reading the rest of the books because I was just like, I need to know how. And now I'm like, into Shatter Me. And yeah, the main character is an emotional female who makes dumb decisions. And it is a romance, not really a like interesting sci-fi dystopian like that aspect of things is kind of there to serve the romance plot more than anything. It's over the top. It's dramatic. It's melodramatic. The writing is like very purpley and flowery and I'm into it. I do think because it is shorter, the books are shorter, I do feel like Tahita Mafi knew that she was telling a story about Juliet and her like romances. <laughs> and like kind of keeps it tight and keeps it mainly to that. There aren't like a million subplots and sub characters that like take up a lot of time and amount to nothing because really the plot isn't that important. I feel like the head of Mavi knew that it's not, that that's not what we're here for. It's not what she's here for. So she kind of stuck to the essentials, the things that we are there for. So I never felt like it was bogged down by trying to continue to pretend to be something it wasn't. I don't know if that's an actual justification or not, but that's kind of how I feel about it. I feel like it is just as trashy, but it's better at being that trash in a way that genuinely is addicting for me. And I do think the head of Mafi's purple prose is more artful. I do think that her like descriptions and poetical ways of talking about things, they're very extra. It's, it's a lot, but I do think there is some genuine poetry and art to the way that she writes that I do enjoy from a craft like wordsmith standpoint more so than Sarah J Maas. That's just how I feel about it. Um, next up is The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. I had many criticisms for The Way of Kings, but the one that I'm that is relevant here now is um, I did criticize it for kind of stopping all the storytelling to tell world building stuff that wasn't being like that we didn't need to know. Um, and there is a fine line and it is very, it's a very, your mileage may vary gray area, subject to preference type thing, how much world building is necessary to know to establish a world as feeling real and how much is extraneous. I felt like a lot of the world building detail in Way of Kings was extraneous, or at least because it was delivered in a way that was kind of into a dumpy, it felt more extraneous because it felt like it was taking time away from the story rather than kind of organically filtering into my awareness as the reader. That said, I've heard this criticism leveled at The Wolf by Leo Carew, which is one of my all-time favorite books. I've read it three times. I'm already itching for a fourth read. <laughs> and I've heard it criticized for the amount of description that Leo Carew includes for the world of the Anakim, for the, the the buildings they build, the way they organize themselves, the their relationship with nature, with the nature itself, all of that. To me, it came across as very much like reading an anthropological ethnography. And when you read an ethnography, all of that is super duper relevant because we're learning about what makes a culture that culture. And it didn't really come across that way to me in, in Way of Kings, partly because I felt like the culture and world building in Way of Kings didn't make sense. <laughs> so for that reason then I also couldn't forgive because I was like you're spending a lot of time telling me all this detail that ultimately doesn't really mesh and make sense so I think I found it more frustrating for that reason whereas in The Wolf 
it feels very, to me, organic. I don't feel like the story is stopping to tell me those things. I feel like it's really important to really see how the Anakim are different from humans because the Anakim are Neanderthals. And so how they operate is different. And it's necessary to understand how different that is. And to them, their home is their everything. And so describing their home to them is dis is essential to describing who they are because who they are is where they are, if that makes sense. Makes sense to me. And I love it. <laughs> so, I mean, arguably I'm being a hypocrite because I'm fine with it in The Wolf when Leo Caro does it, but I did not like it in The Way of Kings. So. Next up, I have Wicked Saints by Emily Duncan, I think, is the author. And I hated that book. <laughs> it was very, like derivative of the Grisha trilogy, in my opinion. Grisha trilogy meets the Raylo ship, and it was just badly executed, in my opinion. However, a lot of the appeal and a lot of the reasons that people did seem to like it was this sort of, like, edgelord romance between the main character, uh, Nadia, and the sort of Darkling-type character, which I found cringy and poorly developed and too over-the-top in terms of, like, um, edgy darkness. And she's like, you're a monster, I can't love you because you're a monster. But I love the shit out of Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. And people who say Six of Crows is good, but Kaz Brecker is an edgelord. Kaz Brecker? <laughs> that is my shit. I fucking love Kaz Brecker. You do not know how much I love Kaz Brecker. Name my car after Kaz Brecker. My license plate is customized to, refer to reference Kaz Brecker. I have like a skull, a crow's skull hanging from my wit mirror in my car for Kaz Brecker. I really like Kaz Brecker. <laughs> and like... To me, there's a lot of subtleties in his character that makes him so much more than just this surface level bitch lord. He's got depth and personality. He's got reasons to be the way that he is. I, okay, like if you look at fan art, yeah, he's an edge lord. But I feel like the reason it works, like I feel like people like Emily Duncan look at something like Cas Brecker and they're like, I can do that. But all they took from Cas Brecker was the window dressing. They took his like outfit and that's it. You know what I mean? And there's just so much more to it. And if you don't have the much more to it in your story, then all you end up with is an empty shell of an edgelord. Kaz Brecker is nuanced and perhaps a little dramatic, but I think he's well-written. I think Leah Bardugo is good at character development. So I think I completely eat up the romance between Kaz Brecker and Inej. I ship them hardcore. I want good things for my Kaz, even though he kind of doesn't deserve them because he's low-key a monster, but Kaz is my spirit animal. Next up, I have Hero of Ages by Brandon Sanderson. That is the third book in the Mistborn trilogy. I did really like the Mistborn trilogy. I really did, and I do recommend it. However, I really didn't care for the way that it ended, which is what my criticism video is about, for which people like to hate me. I didn't like the way that Faith uh, was handled in, in the conclusion of that trilogy. Having faith be a strong component and a large part of the story you're telling, having characters grappling with faith, having questions of faith be really instrumental and significant to the story you're telling, I'm absolutely fine with that. I mean, people for that video like to tell me that I'm, I mean, I, I don't know, they like to tell me a lot of things, but I'm basically saying that like, so what if he's dealing with faith? Like it's a fantasy world. So like he can write whatever he wants in his fantasy world. And those are just the answers in that world. And they accuse me of projecting onto it like real world faith. The way that I read it, the way that it came across to me was like an allegory. Was Brandon Sanderson not so subtly telling us a faith-based allegory, which really left a bad taste in my mouth, <laughs> uh, which is why it bothered me. There's a lot of stories that don't have this sort of one-to-one comparison to make to real world faith where the the conclusions and the answers are handed so cleanly and so definitively where you're like this is the answer to the questions of faith um as if to say that you shouldn't have doubts part of faith the nature of faith both in real life and the way that i prefer it to be depicted is to not have those answers so clean because if the answer is that clean then it's not faith anymore then then it's just like a natural phenomenon that you're studying if that makes sense like the whole point of faith is the leap of faith. And so as soon as you start ham-fistedly giving me answers to faith, that's not faith anymore. So it, it was very heavy-handed in my opinion. I didn't care for it. But so, again, people disagree with me and people tell me that I'm wrong for feeling that way, which is kind of ironic in my opinion, considering that we're talking about how people interpret faith and me having a problem with it not being left open to interpretation. And I'm wrong. Anyway, I really do like The Golden Compass, or as it's known in the UK, The Northern Lights by Philip Pullman. Now, I did not like actually where that series ended up for the exact same reason, so I'm not really a hypocrite. Uh, but he did pretty overtly, in the even in the first book, address uh, faith, except he was less addressing faith and more addressing the institution of the Catholic Church, 
which is why I don't, I mean, I guess this, this one is kind of a lie. I don't really think I'm a hypocrite about this and I'm not even arguing that I am a hypocrite, but I guess arguably, I mean, they, that's the nuance for me. Like, I do like when faith is handled, addressed, when structures of faith, um, faith-based organizations, faith-based things are incorporated, addressed, discussed, debated, grappled with in a fictional fantasy, speculative kind of way and, and in a speculative context. Which is why <laughs> when I say that I didn't like it in Mistborn, it's not that I never like it. I just, when it's handled in the way that it was handled in Mistborn, where it does not leave any room for interpretation, that's when it, I really don't like it. Now, again, Philip Pullman doesn't all, also doesn't really leave room for interpretation in the end of his goal, his Dark Materials trilogy, which I also didn't like. <laughs> but I did like the Golden Compass. So I guess I don't know what I'm trying to say here. Um, I guess I'm trying to say that I'm not a hypocrite about this one. I'm a hypocrite about the other things, but not this one. And I just snuck it in so that I could tell people to leave me the fuck alone. Next up, I have Rage of Dragons by Evan Winter. Rage of Dragons is a revenge story that's nothing but revenge. And I was like, this is really one dimensional and boring because it's literally like the only thing Tao cares about is revenge. It's just revenge, 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 revenge. I'm gonna train to get revenge. I'm gonna battle to get revenge. I'm gonna get badass so I can get revenge. Revenge, 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 revenge. It doesn't even sound like a word anymore. But I love, 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 love Best of Cold by Joe Abercrombie. I think he handles a revenge story a lot better. But technically, Monza Mercado is just as dedicated to her revenge quest as Tao. That's the only thing she cares about. Come hell or high water, nothing else matters to Monza. Just revenge. To me, I think it works better because there are other characters that are they get almost as much screen time as Monza and they don't only care about revenge so you do get that interplay and you get to like examine these other characters and you get other stuff going on for that reason. If we did only follow Monza Mercado and we were only ever in her head it's very possible Best of Cult would I would find it just as boring as I found Rage of Dragons because she is I think she's slightly more nuanced than Tao but she is kind of a woman with one mission and one mission only and that is revenge. So arguably She's just like Tao. Next up, I have Dune by Frank Herbert, which I didn't hate, but I had to take down my review. Unlike Way of Kings, which I just made unlisted so that I'd get like slightly less hatred, I literally made my Dune video unlisted, or uh, I'm sorry, private, because that was insane. I, there's absolutely no amount of like monetization is gonna make that worth it. But Dune, I accused of being up its own ass in, in, in terms of how in love with its own philosophizing it seems to be how it just goes off on just discussing this philosophical idea to the point where I'm like, I don't think you're telling a story. I think you're just like spitting an idea on paper in cool words, but this isn't a story. So it's kind of up its own ass. <laughs> but I love The Secret History by Donna Tartt, which is arguably equally up its own ass <laughs> because there isn't that much of a story in The Secret History. Now I would argue that because of the very nature of the type of book that it is, it's less necessary for it to be telling us quote unquote story because of The Secret History and Dark Academia in general is more about the kind of like philosophical head and emotional journey of the characters involved who are themselves up their own asses. Whereas a space opera I go into and the, the genre demands more plot. <laughs> and I feel like Dune to its own detriment kind of stops having a plot too often to philosophize. And I'm like, maybe write a different book with essays and this uh, save that for that. This is a story. It's like moms who put like a bunch of spinach into the macaroni because they're hoping to like sneak it in. That's what it felt like. It felt like this space opera is the macaroni and we keep getting spinach thrown in because he's like sneaking in the philosophizing, which I know people who love Zune would probably, well, they already did kind of like want to chop my head off for that, but because that is what makes Dune the legendary book that it is. All of the ideas. I just think they're not, I feel like they're delivered in a way that's really inorganic to a space opera. It's keep stopping the philosophize. <laughs> Which, again, a lot of people love the book, have no problem with it, but basically I'm saying I don't have a problem with the book philosophizing being up its own ass, apparently. I just don't like it in Dune. <laughs> and last and probably least is Dangerous Alliance by Janiki Cohen. I complained about it being this stupid, anachronistic, silly book that I couldn't take seriously because of the silliness and unlikability of its characters and the anachronistic portrayal of this historical time period. However, I love Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue by Mackenzie Lee. Now, I would argue that the dialogue is slightly more historically accurate in Gentleman's Guide, but ultimately, 
the nature of the plot is kind of even more silly and unbelievable and, ac- and more anachronistic than Dangerous Alliance. It's debatable. But I feel like the humor is genuinely funny in Gentleman's Guide. And the plot was more interesting to me, even if it was equally silly, stupid, and unbelievable. Pro- again, pro- probably more unbelievable. I just thought it was, I had a better time with it. It was more enjoyable. It was funnier. And the dialogue was slightly less anachronistic. But I mean, basically, I'm forgiving a lot more things with Gentleman's Guide because I like it. Those things are still present in it as they are in Dangerous Lines. If and if I hate a Gentleman's Guide, I would tear it down for very similar reasons, but I just happen to like it. So let me know in the comments down below if you like or dislike the books that I have listed as ones that I like and or dislike. Um, I didn't... yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna piss off a lot of people for the second time because I've listed a lot of books here that already pissed people off the first time that I explained why I didn't like them, but whatever. Let me know your thoughts and feelings in the comments down below. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays. So like and subscribe and I'll see you when I see you.